Awesome. We will go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining. We're happy to have you here in the Digital Build Discussion. So I am Bridget Johnson. I am the project lead for Digital Delta. And um, yeah, we're just uh, excited to be here for, for HIP today. And I have with me my colleague, Tony, um, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tony Salvador. I'm a social science researcher, a psychologist by training, a lot of anthropology work. Awesome. So Tony and I are part of the research team for Headstream. And um, today we are going to be diving into digital delta. So we're going to be talking about um, the problem, the solution, the process. We're going to have a little bit of time for a break and exploration and then walk through a use case example. So with that, we can dig right in to the um, overarching problem that we see. So in the past decade, we have seen a rise in teen suicide, depression, anxiety, and loneliness, and it's still rising. So this is a really big complex issue um, that has many things that affect it. And when we started this program, we really tried to ask a lot of questions and we were trying to understand what was going on. So we asked this question of why are complex problems so hard to solve? And there's a couple different reasons. First is that they're, they're just too big. Um, they can't be understood or solved by a singular person or organization. Um, they're composed of many root factors and root factors are the underlying actions and feelings and situations that, that make up the bigger problem. And if you break those down, the amount of smaller problems that emerge make the whole program or the whole problem really overwhelming. Um, and then on top of that, the root factors are interdependent, um, which prevents you from isolating just one of them to find a solution. Then on top of that, we asked, how do we actually shift this whole issue that we see and create a transformation? So how do we take it from something that isn't currently supporting youth well-being to something that is? And so a complex and super messy problem needed a really creative solution. And that's where Digital Delta comes in. So Digital Delta is working to identify the highest leverage opportunities for impact in youth well-being. It's a tool at the end of the day, and it's for investors and institutions and nonprofits, all, all the people who are interested in a science-backed approach to making digital places healthier and more beautiful for young people. So I'll walk us through a really quick overview, but throughout the, this session, we're going we're gonna to dive into each of these little um, phases. So first off, we had to identify our North Star, and that's really asking, what is the transformation that we want to see? We then had to identify the root factors, and that's all the problems that make up, or the, the smaller bits of problems that make up the, root, the larger problem. We then built um, a network map, um, and I'll show you the, the real one later. It's really beautiful. We analyzed the data coming out the other side, and now we get to share the work that we've done. And I'm so excited to have you here. It's such a fun time. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Tony, who's going to talk a little bit more about why we chose the digital delta method. Hello. So um, in some prior work that we've done uh, in, in, in this space and around teen mental well-being, adolescent mental well-being and social media, uh, we did use a different kind of network approach. And we just want to mention it here because it's the, the background research we did for this particular network you see on your screen now is uh, and the foundation of the research that we use to not only help identify the North Star and sort of guide that development, but also to identify the factors that you'll see as we go along. Um, and just a couple of words about this, and, and all of this is totally available to you uh, in whatever way you'd like. Um, this is a causal loop diagram. It's a, it's a descriptive diagram of the situation. The, there's a couple of main items that I might want to point to. In the center, there's the notion of relationships and the quality of relationships as being central to the uh, adolescent as they're developing and growing into being a full member of society. On the left side, you'll see some uh, issues around how social media interacts with those notions of relationships, right? And the, the main issue there is that social media companies exist to actually be companies and make profits and drive revenue. So the changes are going to be from that point of view and not necessarily 
um, corresponding to what creates good, strong pro-social development um, and relationships. And on the right side, you'll see some of these sort of grayed out little cells. These are sort of like the dark side of the force. These are things that happen that are sort of on the, the negative side, these sort of anti-social, if you will, against the pro-social uh, side of the relationships. What, what's interesting here and the way we were able to use that chart was thinking about um, where you can actually intervene in the system to increase the, the items that need to be increased, increase pro-social relationships and decrease sort of, you know, things like bullying, the stuff that would be antisocial. That's how we use this particular chart. Um, and that's a little bit different than what we're doing in the digital delta, which is where we're thinking about transforming an ecosystem. Um, and, and, and as we'll talk about in a moment, the, the North Star. But I do want to give you an idea about what that means to transform an ecosystem. So uh, in, the, in the next slide, um, we're going to talk about the notion of a keystone species. And, and this just backs us up a little bit uh, some, some years ago. There's a researcher named Bob Payne. He was one of the first people to identify the notion of a keystone species in an ecological environment. And this happens to be uh, in the, the tidal pools in the Pacific Northwest and the coast. And the starfish is the keystone species. Uh, and this was a surprise to many people. Uh, and what he did is go into a tidal pool. He took away all the starfish. And what would happen is the mussels overran everything and all of the other little species just kind of went away. But you put the starfish back and it controls the mussels. And if we look at the next slide, it controls the mussels. And what happens is all of these other species then actually do, do come back. Um, I just need the next slide, Bridget, please. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so you see all these other species, different kinds of algae, different barnacles, different anemones, right? All of this stuff comes back. And the idea here is that a starfish is the keystone it matters to the transformation of the entire ecosystem, whether it's all mussels or whether it becomes more diverse. Um, now, this is a pretty clean example because the starfish is you know, one keystone species. What we're going to see in, in going forward and in other work of this time that we've done, um, it's not necessarily one keystone species. There's a few things together that will actually work to, to catalyze transformation of the system. So I just wanted to sort of highlight that as uh, something that, that uh, we'll, we'll come back to again later. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. So once we knew what we were looking for, it made getting down to business that much easier. Um, so we started with our North Star. And given this is a crowdsourced project, we consulted and vetted our results with youth and professionals alike. Our North Star really was our guiding light. So that meant that each decision in this project was reflected back to this statement. And the question of how do we continue to shift towards a transformation that makes digital experiences healthier and more beautiful for young people. So the next step in our process was the development of factors. And so we had nine months of research, a review of both academic and popular literature. We created that causal loop systems map that Tony just walked us through. We then identified the initial list of root factors. And as you can imagine, there was a plethora of them at the beginning. We had 180 of them that we came up with. Um, and what we did is we vetted the root factors through consultations with focus groups and experts and especially youth. And we did all these different focus groups with them, asking them what was missing and making sure that these were the right root factors. After that, we then synthesized the data and pared it down to about 77 root factors. We then created a survey that actually allowed us to crowdsource the data from people across the system. Um, many of you, I, I think in the room actually participate in this, so we're, we're happy to have you here. Um, and what that did is it allowed people across the system, so people working in um, healthcare, people who were mental health professionals, school teachers, young people, you name it, they were able to participate and help us help inform the kind of data that we had. And really what we were asking is we were trying to understand how these root factors were related. So we were asking if one root factor increases, how does that affect another root factor? And we were interested in its relationship. So we were interested in whether there was no clear relationship, whether it increased or it decreased. And as you can imagine, we, this produced a immense amount of data. So it was 77 root factors that had to be rated against all 76 other root factors. 
and I'm excited to share the actual data outcomes with you all. Um, we had this survey open for about two months last November and December, and it required a huge calculated effort, um, which makes the amount of data and also the diversity of data really worth celebrating. So we had close to 22,000 answers on how these root factors relate to each other, 13,000 answers um, just specifically from young people. We had 802 community members participate. And then um, importantly, 56% of the data came from young people, 54% came from Black, Indigenous, and Latinx, and people of color, 54% from female, and 30, roughly 30% from LGBTQ. BTQ plus um, folks. And so the diversity of this data is really significant because this is who we're building solutions for. It's for these communities. And so it's super vital to have their voices heard in such a strong way throughout the data. And then on top of that, it honors how we are committed to design with and for youth. And this data really is a, a confirmation of that, that effort. And so this data is actually what allowed us to find these starfish, or we call them catalysts. Um, and Tony's going to explain a little bit more on actually how we found them. Right. So if we remember, there was the starfish. Starfish in, eats the mussels, other things grow, starfish out, uh, mussels grow, other things don't. Uh, and that became the keystone species. Uh, but we're talking about a human system with you know, institutions and people and ideas and things like that. So we're thinking about uh, keystone species in terms of there being catalytic and of, of if those problems are solved, some of those factors are solved for, then those have a higher probability of transforming the whole network. So there's two ways to think about what is a keystone or what is a catalytic factor in our, in our network. One of them is thinking about reach and one of them is thinking about leverage. Um, in terms of leverage, what we're talking about are finding those nodes that have the fewest incoming links, so the fewest things that are influencing them, and the most outgoing links, right? So in, ter in terms of just reach, the two on the right have the highest leverage, right? There's only one, one thing coming into each of those and a whole bunch of them going out. Um, but we're looking for the overall average. And in terms of reach, we're looking for the number of other nodes that are reached on that are, are accessed or reached on two hops. So we're looking at reach, how many nodes are accessed on two hops, and leverage, uh, what is the fewest number of incoming links and the maximum number of outgoing links because that gives us the most influence in the system. If we look at the next slide. Yeah, so, and, that, and that's what this says. It, it's that the, the problems are constrained by few others and that they, if solved, they have broad reach through the system. And so that's what a catalytic factor or a keystone problem is for us. Thanks, Tony. So now is the really fun part. I get to show you the actual live uh, visualization. So I will go ahead and um, show you guys. This is our website. Um, this is a publicly available tool and we're so excited to share it with you. Um, everything that you would ever wanna know is on this website of how you can get involved, why it matters, um, the research that we did leading up to and during the program. Um, so if you go ahead and scroll down, you'll find lots of good details and things that you can explore, um, but most Specifically, you can explore the actual map. So you go right here, you click on explore the interactive digital delta map. And this is our map. Um, let's see, is it loading? Okay, it looks like it's loading a little funny for me. Let me see if I can, yeah, let's close it too quickly and reopen and try. Okay, so this is the result of um, the connections of 77 root factors. And so um, if I scroll in, let's see. It, hey, Tony, is it loading slowly for you? Can you let me know? Um, it's a little slow, but the, the nodes are really quite large. I don't know why okay. they kind of. Okay, that's what it's doing for me too. So let's see if I can, there we go. There we go. Does that look okay? Perfect. Um, so 
this is the result of the 77 root factors um, and how they are related. Um, we did some initial analysis because it originally looked like a big ball of spaghetti. And so to come out the other side with clarity, we had to do quite a bit of analysis. Um, some things I'll, I'd love to highlight. So there are some filters and ways that you can explore the data. Um, we've done some additional tagging so that you can explore them by grouping or um, some tags that are related to what the actual root factor is about. Um, and then you can also hover over any one root factor to understand its position in the network and what it's connected to. Um, so this is one way to explore the data. Um, and then you can scroll down. There's even more things you can look and find out what these top catalysts are that we've been talking about. Um, over here, you can see if you click on any of the these filters, um, you'll be able to see them show up quickly in this list. And then there's a couple different snapshots that we'll walk through. So this is the, the full network. Um, and then this one more accurately explains what the catalysts are. So through a lot of analysis that I mentioned, and it's so much that I can't actually fully go into it here, but um, we found our starfish or our catalysts. And they are colored yellow here. And um, on average, the catalysts that we focused on had a high catalyst score and were relatively upstream. So a catalyst score you can think of as influence over the network. And if something is upstream, we like to use the analogy of just thinking about a river and an ecological system. So if something is upstream, it's going to affect every single thing downstream. And so let's walk through a couple examples together just so we can get a better understanding. So if we go down here to find something that has a relatively low catalyst score and is pretty downstream, so like this one is the level of self-esteem, which is maybe not quite as intuitive. We know that self-esteem is so important, but it doesn't have high influence over the network, and it's relatively downstream because of the amount of things that, one, affect self-esteem, and then two, also the amount of things that your own self-esteem affects. And so it's highly, highly connected, but it doesn't have a ton of leverage over the, the network. But then on the other hand, if we go look at one of these catalysts, say access to mental health resources, um, it actually has relatively few things that directly affect it, but it affects a lot of the network and it affects a lot of the other root factors. And you can imagine that the amount of things that uh, directly affect your access to mental health resources is significantly lower than the amount of things that affect your self-esteem. So um, these 13 root factors um, really matter because throughout all of this analysis, they consistently remained in the top 75th percentile. So that is giving us the confidence that these are the ones that we wanted to focus on and um, they pretty quickly sorted into three categories for us that we will discuss in a second. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more because we're going to provide this link and we'd love for everybody to just explore um, the website as well as the map. Um, there's a few other things I'd love to mention just to make sure that uh, you can navigate it. Um, if you have any questions, there's little descriptions down here. You can scroll in and out to zoom into the map. Um, whichever of these snapshots you click on and then you go to the filters, that's the, the map that will remain. So you can filter through the different snapshots. You can adjust all of these different things. So for us, we focused on all the catalysts that were in the, the 75th percentile. That's what we were interested in. But if you were interested in these other ones that maybe didn't have quite as high a catalyst score, you're welcome to check those out too. Some other things just to note is um, if you click on any of these filters, um, you can always re reset here and you can clear them or you can exit out here and that will also clear them. So um, we're going to give folks about a five minute break um, and I'm going to provide the link in the chat and um, we'd love after the break to um, discuss questions. We'll chat about these three categories as well as the implications of the map. And then we'll, we'll show you one of our use cases and the ways in which we actually have used this. So with that, let me go ahead and provide the link in the chat. And um, we'll come back in about five minutes.
Okay, there we are. And so we'll see you um, at, we'll come back maybe in about six minutes. We'll see you soon. Hi, Bridget and Tony. Uh, good to see you both. Tony, it's been a while. I just wanted to let you both know that I need to sneak away to be with my family for a little bit now. Um, but Hope Lab is very interested in what you're doing, as you know, I'm sure. And I think maybe some of us would love to drill into this tool with one of you in a little more detail after today. Would it be okay if I reach out for that? Great. And I know, at least in this room right now, is our VP of Research, Jana harris Hados, and um, I'm sure she and I would love to chat with you further and maybe some others as well. That'd be awesome. Thank yeah. you. It's great to see the results. Yay, we're so glad. Yeah, Tony and I, we'll, we'll talk about this for at length for a long time. We love this stuff, so. Sweet. Thank, Thank you so much. Of course.
Awesome. So we'll go ahead and give folks just a, maybe like 30 seconds to wrap up and then we'll jump back into it. Um, during the break, I had someone reach out asking about if there's a way in which you can um, download the data and or visuals. And yes, you can. That's something I love to answer. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show that. But I would love to take the next maybe five minutes to answer any questions if you have them specifically about the map and the, um, the interface that it's in. Um, we also are just open to questions. So if you um, have questions, you're welcome at any point to just put them in the chat and we're happy to answer. So if you um, are super interested, say we've clicked on, um, we're interested in what the catalysts are and the ones that are maybe related to, um, let's see, what would be, what would be something interesting? Or maybe we're just interested in the catalyst. You can go down to this um, little icon down here that says export current selection. And what that will do, that allow you to one, gather the data, because this is um, an open public source tool. And two, it'll download um, a graphic for you. So you will be able to capture anything within this that you're interested in. Yeah, so um, I will stop sharing. Are there any other questions related to um, this tool? Okay, in that case, we'll go ahead and keep on going. So I'm going to pass it over to Tony, who's going to chat with us a little bit more about how we came out the other side of figuring out what the catalytic factors were. Great, thanks, Bridget. Um, all right, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about these catalytic factors, and we'll just sort of talk about them a little bit. There's, it's not super complicated uh, and the slides are pretty clear. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce sort of another little concept here as a way of understanding what it is that we're, that we're suggesting what we're doing. Um, one way to think, another way to think about this, this question around how to make the internet a more beautiful place for young people or how to support um, adolescent well-being with digital places and experiences and anything of that nature is to think about it as a wicked problem. It, it's it's a, a wicked problem is one that's difficult to characterize and, and, and you know, resists transformation for whatever reason. So if we think about the notion of a wicked problem that came to us from you know, some earlier work in, from MIT back in the 60s or 70s, I can't recall, um, and, and that the wicked problems are often sort of complex systems. So they're non-deterministic inputs and outputs. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex socio-technical system and if we try to do one thing, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So if we think about, oh, look, everybody can be a publisher. Well, what does it mean for everybody to publish? And we sort of see that that doesn't always work in the way that we imagined it might work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so what we're doing here is suggesting we have a wicked problem. We have a complex socio-technical system. And so we're looking for a, a commensurate kind of response for that to transform that system across. And that's where these catalytic factors come in. By, by saying these are the factors that if solved for, if we address these, then we have a better chance of transforming the overall system because those factors have positive direct relationships with the other factors downstream. And so the, the 13, there are 13 catalytic factors as Bridget talked about. Um, in our case, they don't look like a starfish. It's not one factor and then everything drops off and it's sort of a, you know, a, a step function. It's really more of a continuous function. So we chose those catalytic factors that are in the 75th percentile and above. Handily for, <laughs> for communication and for us, they actually collapsed into three categories. So we don't have to talk about 13 things all the time where each one is different from another, but there are three main categories, positive relationships, accessible resources, and balanced content. And we can, we can see a little bit how they break out in the next slide, um, where if it's, those 13 factors are on the right and there's positive relationships. So there's these notions of role models for you know, parents or strong adult role models, parents in particular, friends that they spend uh, time with online and social groups, things like um, churches or you know, other, other forms of social groups that they may have, sports teams, things like that. Um, there's also resources. 
and we'll talk about briefly, but you can see it ranges. It's not just mental health resources. It's also basic needs like food, shelter, safety, things like that. Um, and then finally content. And we'll spend a little bit more time there because it was interesting that not only um, did they talk about some of these things, but it's young people who are talking about some of these things. So um, in the next slide, uh, we, know from the, the, we know from the literature that positive relationships matter. We didn't know how they would matter in terms of transforming the ecosystem. We know from psychologists and, and experts that even having one positive adult role model can make a difference in a young person's life. Uh, what was interesting to us is that in addition to finding that a parental role model makes a difference, that also spending time with their friends online and then spending time with social groups, all three of those actually made it up into this, this higher end of, of, of potential impact. That, that was kind of interesting to us that they're saying, look, it's actually a range of things, not just having a role model, but actually having sort of a breadth of experience in terms of, of growing up and a breadth of relationships that they can grow with and learn with and, and, and experience with. So, so that's the, the first one. The, the second one is around this notion of accessible resources. And again, it makes a little bit of sense that if you have information about different kinds of health, physical, mental, sexual health, and access to resources to actually support that development, we know that that's important. Um, we also know, and it came out in the data, that actually having basic needs, food, shelter, safety, all of those things are also important. Another way of thinking about that is the flip side of not having basic needs of food, shelter, safety, not having access to these resources. One can experience trauma um, in a variety of ways, of course, and then it goes unresolved. And unresolved trauma leads us down a garden path that, that doesn't end well often. Uh, and so, or I don't mean that so finally, but it, it just doesn't go in the best possible way. So we, we, we see that it makes sense to have this notion of accessible resources in conjunction with having these, these good sire positive relationships. And then finally, in the third category, we think about balanced content. And what was interesting here was that they're telling us, you know, the youth were telling us that actually balanced content really matters. Despite a lot of the, the, you know, the rhetoric that's out there, a lot of the press, you know, the, the phones are glued to their hands, they're on social media all the time, um, that, that they see a lot of content that they ought not. They know, they know amongst themselves that moderating the content they process matters, that balancing their online activities matters, right? Um, they know that they, they should be seeking sort of, you know, positive feedback and, 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 you know, minimizing and being away from sort of this hateful and hurtful stuff and negative feedback. Uh, we, we know those things matter. And in, you know, it, part of it, it goes into the very definitions of these phrases that if you were taking the survey, you'd be able to see what these phrases meant. Um, but, but part of it is also, that it, it's, we're not trying to get, sorry, we're not trying to get away from, um, we're not trying to also get away from the notion of, of um, not being able to you know, handle adversity. So we're not doing that. We are trying to suggest, and that's where the, the factors came in. And the, what I think people are telling us here is that they're, they're looking for non-traumatic feedback. They're looking for ways to actually recover from. They're way, looking for ways to learn from. They're looking for balance, right? And I think those are these, these, these factors here that sort of come out in this notion of balanced content. Um, and they, they, I think they, they get it, they get it intrinsically. And so one of the things that we can do is try to, to support um, entrepreneurs and businesses and investment that sort of address these three main categories. And then I guess the last thing that I would wanna talk about is um, what, what is this, sort of some of the things that are always nice to know is like, what does it tell us and what does it not tell us? Um, and, and, uh, uh, and then we'll get into a, a slight example of how we kind of use the network in a slightly different way. So there's a couple of things just to, to, to think about. Um, the results here, they point to where to take action among these factors, but it doesn't tell you what to do. That's really open to interpretation. That's for entrepreneurs, that's for um, in institutions, that's for nonprofits, that's for people to sort of come and, and participate in those spaces at, with those nodes. So that's, it doesn't tell you what to do. It's not constraining in any way. Um, a second thing it's not doing is saying, oh, you only have to work on these 13 and you shouldn't work on say something like self-assessment, uh, self-esteem, that it's not saying that either. Self-esteem we know is really important and it may actually be a, a, a really important area. Somebody might have a really good idea and that's terrific. It's important for development. It's just not catalytic for transforming the overall ecosystem. So for organizations that are thinking about how do we transform an ecosystem, it's those 13 we contend that need to be addressed. But that doesn't tell you anything about what's important to work on 
ind independently of the ecosystem. It's also not telling you about market. It's not giving us a market segment size or a market sizing or a market assessment of any kind. It's talking about the factors that transform the ecosystem. So market demand, market making, all of that is part of the activity of the entrepreneurs that might be participating in that place. And then finally, the factors themselves, um, it's not, we don't, we don't have a, a stance, at least at this point, I think we'd have to, you know, talking with Eric Berlo who worked with us on this and talking with others, we don't have a stance at the moment that says, this one is the one to work on and not the other 12, or we should work on these three. We, we don't know, it's a complex problem. We don't know if somebody comes in or comes up with a really good idea that addresses a few of those nodes, those catalytic factors, that, that could have an outsized effect, or maybe it's a bunch of participants and having small continuous effects. We don't know how that plays out. That's part of the uncertainty associated with what do you actually do? Um, but we do think that if we're playing in that, in that space of those 13 nodes, of those 13 factors, if we're playing in that space, then we have the best chance of actually participating in the transformation of the network, of the ecosystem, making it a, a more beautiful place for young people. So we'll show an example of that now. Yeah, thanks, Tony. So we're going I'm going to go into a use case of how the Headstream innovators address the 13 catalysts. So what we did is we gathered um, 60 innovators um, from both of the Headstream cohorts, and then we went through each company thinking about which root factors they address. Um, so if we take a look at the Headstream innovators, we wanted to understand which ones or which specifically which catalytic factors they address. Um, and um, when we were doing this, we had a couple things to note. We wanted to first say that um, working in the 77 root factors for this, um, this system is great. And to Tony's point, we can't really say that one is better than the other. What we can say is that these 13 catalysts have the highest likelihood of pushing us towards that transformation that we want to see. And so that's kind of where this mindset is coming from. And just being mindful that if folks are working within any of these root factors, we are so excited to have you here and be part of this place and continuing to help shape digital places for young people. So I'm going to go ahead and show you um, the live map. OK, so here we go. Um, so a couple of things to note, um, every little node that is pink is an innovator and everything that is green is a catalyst. Um, the innovators are connected to the catalyst that we believe they are trying to address. So this is from Headstream's point of view. This We didn't consult the, the specific innovators on this. Um, and some are connected to quite a few and some are connected to just one. And so let's walk through um, a couple different examples. So for instance, this is um, a company called Nod that is connected to two uh, root factors. So Nod is an app that's designed to provide evidence-based support um, and tools to help young people build strong relationships and really combat loneliness. So then knowing that, um, it's connected to the frequency of positive feedback on, in online activities and access to mental health resources. And we ask, okay, so how does it address those things? Um, it's reducing the impact of loneliness on young people's well-being. And then additionally, it's helping people achieve social connections that they need and want for success. Um, and so for, in this specific instance, this innovator is connected to two catalysts. Um, we can try another one. So here's another company called Two Swim. If you click on it, um, you'll see a sidebar pop up. So that'll help explain a little bit more of the information. We also link to their website. Um, so Two Swim is a community focused um, social messaging app and it's connected to the time they spend online with friends. And the, the reason it's connected is that 
And um, Two Swim is working to create genuine connections and thriving communities. And so it's really intentional curation of social messaging. So the, the things that really matter is that, yes, it's time spent online, but it's with friends and it's with community and it's with support. So Two Swim is an example of a company that's just addressing one. And then we'll, we can look through one more example if we scroll in. Um, up here is Lesson B. And so Lesson B is all about personalized health education. And so it is an online education platform that is promoting health and lifelong learning. Um, and so the root factor that it's connected to is the access to trusted information about mental, physical, sexual health and development. Um, and we asked, okay, how is it addressing this? And what they're doing is they're helping young people build social emotional skills, um, learning how to promote personal, family, community health, um, learning about health education, um, and then learning about mental health education at school, home, and work. So um, there's a couple of other things to mention um, relating to this map. Um, while it is really beautiful and we love looking at this map, um, there's a couple things to note that one, Tony already mentioned, um, there's, there's things we can say and there's things we can't say. So we don't know if um, an innovator should put all of their energy into one specific catalytic factor over another. We also can't say what is the difference between um, supporting one catalytic factor versus four in the overall grand scheme of trying to make this shift towards this transformation. Those are things that we can't measure and we don't know because this is an ecosystem and there's tons of variability. So just because it looks some way in the map, we can't really make absolute statements about it. But what does matter is that there's lots of people in this space, lots of people who care, who are working on these things. Um, and what we can say is that the more people who are in this space, the better we can contribute towards this transformation. And so we're looking what we can do for the whole system. And the way in which we're doing this is we're finding what action an individual can take that actually contributes towards this really high and lofty goal. So it's both a individual action as well as a contribution towards something that's really lofty and incredible and something that we're really excited to work on. And, and this work really, really exemplifies what Second Muse is about and working towards. Because Second Muse at the end of the day is trying to transform an ecosystem and Headstream specifically. And we're interested in companies that are addressing these catalytic factors and that are doing it successfully. Um, and what Second Muse is doing is we are investing differently. And we're looking to support individuals and support them supporting each other um, and working on becoming more sustainable. So I'm going to stop right there because I'm, I'm going to pass over to Tony so he can add, add any other thoughts in. Um, yeah. I'm good. I think that maybe we can open to some questions. Uh, maybe we can take one here from the chat. Is that all right, Bridget? Yeah, I think that's perfect. So I, I think one that popped up that I, can, I couldn't possibly answer in the chat <laughs> um, from Amanda Leonard uh, is, you know, how do we think the pandemic may have influenced things here, specifically relationships? Um, I think there's two ways to sort of go about addressing this question. One way is to sort of think about how did the pandemic influence sort of just the survey itself, the, the taking of the survey. Um, and uh, we, we do have a little bit of, of sort of triangulated feedback and, and Bridget probably can tell you this a little better, but I'm gonna do it anyway, just because um, I started. Um, we, we did, we, we have a relationship with people who used to be called 100K and 10, and now we're also called Starfish and they use a similar, a similar they, they use this method. Um, and we worked with them back when they were 100K and 10 as well. And uh, we ended up talking with Grace uh, there and Bridget talked with her and said that, yeah, we know we're, we're, we're doing the survey and we're kind of wondering are there any, you know, tips of the, you know, tips of the trade, you can tell us. And she's like, you released the survey now? Um, and what, because we released it, we were gonna release it on election day and we thought mm, maybe we shouldn't do that. And then we released it a week later thinking, okay, after a week, it would be kind of okay. Um, that was kind of not what we thought, but we had to release it at that point. And so we opened a survey in this crazy election during a pandemic and near the end of the term for a lot of the students um, who were like busy learning how to be students in a very new way. Um, so there was a lot of the, the sort of the environment that was not quite normal for them um, or for anyone for that matter. 
and I think that goes to the second part is that it really wasn't it wasn't normal for anybody right so everybody was kind of changing it wasn't that they were necessarily um, affected although they were but everybody was affected in one way or another so we don't know if there was any particular influence one way or, or, or another on the findings what we do know is that uh, in the process of analysis when we're going through this we run about uh, we take the nodes that actually have direct relationships. This is just going to be a quick aside. We take the nodes that have direct relationships, and then we randomly start dropping half of the relationships out of those, and then run the network and see what we get. And then we do that a thousand times. So we basically run like a little bit of a Markov process, right? Where we take out um, randomly links, uh, run the network, and then we end up taking the network becomes the average, right, of the, the highest no leverage nodes and the highest reach nodes over those thousand, and that's where it becomes stable. Um, we think. And so uh, the, the, because of that, we do imagine that sort of any little differences may actually be sort of factored out of, out of the network. Um, and, and because everybody was going through the pandemic simultaneously, we think that, that it's, uh, uh, any of those differences there might settle out as well. What we can't say is if there was an overall effect of the pandemic on everybody across where suddenly they discovered mom is like the best human being on the planet. And they all said, we all need a relationship with our mom, um, which they, they might have and they, they should, and that'd be all awesome. Um, but we, we do think that, that it, it sort of settles out a little bit in the noise. Uh, we also, the one more thing I would say about that is that we also, I think uh, we do sort of try to look and see where things corresponded and where they didn't and, and uh, we, we I think I would have been um, a little bit surprised if some measure of relationships didn't come out at all. I, I would have been just remarkably surprised at that, um, just because of the, the full-on range of research. So um, that's there. But anyway, I, that's my 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 opinion on this. I would totally take other people's opinions because we're we are working with the method and trying to improve it on a continuous basis. And if there are ways people see to be able to get at these issues and get at these kinds of differences, we'd love to start incorporating those in and, and thinking about them. There's a variety of things to think about with the method itself. It's been used for about ten years sporadically, um, but we're, we've been sort of bringing it back a little. We, we, it's a longer story there, but we've been bringing it back um, and, and, and trying to you know, improve it and work with it as, as, as we see people starting to recognize mm, maybe some of the challenges we're facing aren't necessarily point challenges where if I do this one thing, everything's fixed and recognizing that they're sort of these complex challenges that need complex solutions. I wanted to um, quickly address your comment, John, saying that you didn't see the innovators and catalyst tab on the website, and that is correct. That one is a use case that is not currently public, um, but we hope that it that it does inspire you about the different ways that this data can be used, given it's public and available, and you can absolutely um, play around in it. Um, I had one question that, that was just asked to me directly, Tony, and so it was wondering how do we factor in privacy and the right to forgetting into young people's experiences online? Go for it, you go ahead. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so I, that was actually one of the the uh, one of the factors was the idea of being able to forget on the internet and to remember sort of some of the better things. Um, forgetting bad things that happened on the internet, I don't believe is one of the. Did that was that one of the? I'm a little confused now. Was that one of the factors for getting the bad things? Yeah. Um, the the. the uh, <sighs> How do you weave that into the net? Um, I don't know how you weave that into the net. I think that's part of the ecosystem transformation, but it's clearly something that would support the well-being of teens from what they say. Uh, we, we, we do think that that's actually, an, there's an analog of the sort of forgetting in the pre-digital real world um, where, you know, memories fade, right? The salience of memories fade over time, but on, on, on the internet, that's, that salience is, is just, just the same today as it was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, when you see it in print on online. I um, mean, so that, that, that's something that doesn't correspond, this notion of forgetting and sort of having things in the net, um, they, they don't correspond in, in sort of these in sort of biological ways that we've had in sort of sociological, bi social, so, psychosocial biological ways that we've seen in the past where, and, and, and also the range um, of course matters. And this is things everybody online knows here. Um, you know, something that can be seen by everybody versus something that happened in a small group of three or four people. 
uh, and then you know maybe was told secondhand, third hand, but you know there, there's a decay of the salience associated with the event, um, whereas online that decay doesn't actually exist. So there, there's this notion of forgetting is something that I think several other researchers have done, done a lot of work on. Um, clearly, the EU thinks about it, but they don't think about it in this way in terms of mental health, mental well-being, development of youth. Um, the, the notion of forgetting that I think comes back to. Uh, some of the factors that didn't rise to the top, which was uh, along the lines of knowing the effect of posting something online, um, being able to, um, to, to, to understand what the value is of posting something online and have an intentionality of doing that. Uh, there were several factors in that range and they didn't come to the, the surface. And so there's, I think, an additional awareness that, that occurs there. Sorry, probably not. I basically don't really know. So I was kind of thinking through it a little bit. <laughs> it's a really tough question. Um, there's some other things that are just on here that I'm seeing now. Uh, I think that that's right, Craig. I think that this notion here of, of looking at the broader ecosystem of mental health firms, of, of youth, of all of that stuff mapped onto this ecosystem, I think would be fascinating. And I think it really corresponds and somebody else was, um, Conan here was saying that, you know, sort of this, how do, how do you think about connecting companies that are really focused on one thing, say with people that are doing broader spectrum kind of work. I think these are all exactly the right kinds of questions and the way to, one way to think about using the, the, the results of this network. Um, we, there's, Eric, Eric is pretty good at this too, of, of sort of taking databases that exist and sort of, you know, working the database so that it's actually structured just right and then banging it up against the the network that exists like what Bridget was showing us with the, the just the headstream um, entrepreneurs. Um, I think that that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's precisely one way to use the network to sort of orient where people are doing and what, where, what people are working on and how they're working on it. Um, there's another way of thinking about it too, though, that I think that it follows if you just go down that, that, that little path. Um, sort of very large companies uh, that, you know, large social media companies have multiple aspects to them. And that becomes a difficult thing to actually work with in, in the map. And so I think that, that gets to the, the last question here from um, Conan um, is, is thinking about how can we do this a little bit better? And I think that's an open question for us is how do we think about taking something like um, YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or something like that, where there are many different aspects of the service or the services they offer, and they address many different elements of the net under different use models in different contexts, how to sort of break those apart in a way that's fair uh, and, 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 and that actually gets us at some of the, the issues that are involved. Because just labeling, you know, let's just use an example, just labeling Facebook or YouTube or sorry, and, and putting it on the map and connecting it to the different um, factors, um, I, I think isn't going to really tell us that. So we need something a bit more granular, I, I suspect, in, in that space. Yeah, and also just to add to that, um, because the map is publicly available, you're welcome to explore. And what Tony and I did for those 60 innovators is we we sat with them and we we learned about them and figured out, you know, what do we think that they're trying to address? And so it does take a little bit of work up front, but once you address them, you can single them out in the um, in the map, and then you can also look at what those are really closely connected to to, to better understand. Um, we probably only have time for one more question. So, uh, Theodore, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Hi. Thank you, guys. Thank you both so much. This is such interesting research and just such a a, a wealth of information. Information. Um, I had a couple of questions about a couple of the um, kind of the uh, the thirteen um, factors that you kind of zoomed zoomed in on. I was just wondering if if you kind of had more um, information on them or or more kind of um, perhaps qualitative data on them. One is um, this idea of spending time with friends, and it specifically includes the word online. So it's not just spending time with friends, but it's spending time with friends online. Um, for one, given that pandemic question we had before, I'm wondering whether that had an impact. And I'm wondering if there's any information in terms of spending time um, with friends in the real world, which I know young people don't use that term, us older people use real versus digital. but. Um, actually spending time with them in person versus spending time on them online, whether there are any differences that emerge there. As a psychologist, I would hypothesize that there are differences, but of course, um, we need to trust them to, to tell us that. So that, that's one question. Um, the other one has to do with one of the other factors, which is um, around 
um, experiencing positive experiences online, which sounds great, but that was kind of elaborated on in terms of the likes and shares and comments. And we also know that that can have, um, it's, it's kind of a slippery slope that can kind of go off into a very, very um, negative place in terms of that excessive reliance on those as a form of uh, a kind of positive feedback. So I'm wondering whether there was any information um, there as well, because we know that that can have some really negative outcomes um, for, for mental health. Um, and I'm sure I'd have a bunch of other questions, but I'll, I'll save those for another time when, once I've gone through the map a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. We've like really run out of time. So I can't, I will follow up with you on Attendify because I would love to answer these questions for you. Um, so with that, I just want to acknowledge that coming up right now is the Impact Navigator session. It's in the same room if you'd love to just stay here. We're excited. Um, it's led by Megan, who is incredible. She's right here. Um, and if you're not, if you want another option that you can head over to the um, Headstream demo that with the innovators. So that's still going on. You can jump in there too. Um, so with that, thanks everybody for joining the Digital Delta session and um, that's it for us. Thanks, bye. Um, Theodora, just while we're here, if that's all right, but just really quickly, um, sure. killing me here. Sure. Um, your question about online versus the real world. Oh my God, super important. It's been a debate that's gone on for a long time. We do think that they meant online because there were other factors in there that actually had in person, right? So we think they meant right. online. That is something that could have been impacted by the, the pandemic because they were spending mm -hmm. more time with their friends online. But we also think the other hypothesis would be to say, oh, look, you know, I really want to see my friends. Um, I do personally think, and I agree with you, even though they say there's no difference between online and real world, there is. I mean, we know there is just 